How's it going? My name is Aaron Rosen, and uh, my colleagues are Eric, Dan, Salvatore, and Somek, and we set, uh, we set up this OpenStack Quantum Lab, basically demoing some of the new features that we have in Grizzly. So <clears throat> I think we have a few extra labs. Um, if, if people didn't get them, um, you can raise your hands, and we can try and uh, feed those out to you guys. But on the piece of paper, you'll see there'll be an IP address, and there's two different ways to access the lab. The first way is you could just SSH directly to the IP address. And the username to do that is Nasira. And then it'll prompt you for the password, and the password is Nasira again. N I C I R A, right there. Okay. Um, so just to be clear, these are these are you know internet accessible labs. Um, they're running in our OpenStack cloud that, that we run back at oh now VMware. Uh, and so you know don't don't start using one and then give a copy to someone else because you'll be clobbering. You'll be working on the same the same setup. So we were able to give um, basically one lab set up to each. You know, for, for each chunk of tables here, you've got one on each side, so four per row. So share with your neighbors, and then we have a set of extras that if you, you know, really don't like your neighbor or something, uh, you know, raise your hand and try to get an extra one from Somic uh, or uh, Sachin. So I also want to, you know, I also want to have each peop, uh, Somic, Salvatore, and all of them introduce yourselves and kind of wave your hand. So these are the people uh, that you can kind of bug with questions. Um, if you get stuck, et cetera, you know, we'll, Aaron will try to move forward at a you know, reasonable pace that most people can keep up with, and then we'll be jumping in and trying to help uh, where people are getting stuck. So if you're, if you're one of those helpers, just raise your hand, please. Wave it. Um, come, come and grab one of us, or raise your hand, and we'll come find you. It's probably easier. Cool. So the two ways to get there is either via SSHing if you have a shell on your computer, or the second way is you can get there through a VNC uh, console. So if you just point your web browser to the IP address on the piece of paper, and the password again is Nasera, and this will bring up a, a VNC console into the machine that we're going to be running the demo from. So I'm going to wait a couple of seconds and let everyone uh, get logged in. If you guys have uh, trouble logging in, just raise your hand and uh, someone can help you. Cool, so is everyone pretty much logged in? Anyone having trouble? Raise your hand if you're Cool, so when you guys, while you guys are going in, I'm just going to give uh, some overview about what we're going to be talking about. Um, Along with the lab, there's also an Etherpad link right here, which would be helpful to follow along with. I have it on the second slide, too. So basically, in this lab, we're going to build a multi-tier application. I'll get into those details more later. But what we're really going to do is we're going to show off the new features that uh, landed in Grizzly. So some of those features are security groups. And previously in Folsom, Nova, we were leveraging Nova for their security groups. And and we implemented them in quantum because it made a little bit more sense because quantum is a networking component. And security groups have to do with the network. Um, security groups in quantum are a little bit richer. We also support egress filtering. So for instance, if you want to block communication from your VM going out, um, the quantum security groups provide a way to do that. We'll also be demoing the load balancer as a service. So basically, you can provision a load balancer programmatically, specify to your pool members, and show load balancing requests. Uh, another weak point that we had in Folsom was metadata with overlapping IPs. Uh, Nova, previously, Nova Network doesn't allow overlapping IPs. So in Grizzly, we implemented a metadata proxy agent to allow this to work. Uh, in addition, we, there's a DHCP agent scale out and uh, various other improvements and cleanups. So once you get logged into your lab here, this is the topology that we have set up. Uh, you'll land on this desktop which is accessible via VNC and SSH, um, and also RDP if you have a RDP client. Uh, once you land on that, you'll want to access this node. 
which is the external client that's on the internet. And we're going to be provisioning all of the stuff via the CLI from that client. Um, we have uh, two hypervisors running Nova Compute. On these hypervisors, they have the Quantum Open vSwitch plugin agent. And that's responsible for building the layer two fabric in order to span layer two over layer three segments. And there's also the controller node, which runs all the API endpoints, and the network node, which controls the L3 stuff, the metadata agent, and DHCP. So let's go ahead and uh, get situated and, and get on this node, the external client. So if you're using the VNC, uh, you'll have to open a terminal. And then Yeah, so if you go to this Etherpad link, the slides are also on them. Uh, can you guys read this? There's no way you can read that. And then is there a pointer to the slides as well, or is that on that page? Uh, okay. It's on that page. OK, great. Yeah, so that's the. Does anyone need another second? Yeah, so once you access uh, this Etherpad, the, the slides are located right here. You should be able just to click on that. Uh, this Etherpad link is also on the quantum section of the Etherpad links for the Havana uh, Summit stuff. So it's also there. You know where it is. Cool. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to hop on to that external network node that I have here in this uh, topology. So his address is 10.127.1.201. So the two ways to get there, open a VNC, through the VNC, if you open a terminal here, you should be able just to type that IP address and then hit enter. And the password again for this is Nasira. The second way is if you just SSH to the IP address on the page, and once you land on that landing host, which is this uh, desktop host, then you can SSH directly to that. <clears throat> Is anyone having any problems getting in, getting to this point? Cool, so what we're gonna be working on today is we're gonna try and uh, build this multi-tier application. So basically what this application is, is we have two web servers, a database server, a jump box, and a load balancer. So the way this works is a tenant is gonna go ahead and pr uh, provision some security groups. Uh, these security groups are gonna be self-referential security groups. So the first security group we're gonna create is uh, for the jump host. So the jump host, what his job is, is basically you'll be able to SSH to him and then get into all of your instances. So the idea for this is so that all of your um, infrastructure and your instances don't have to be public facing. So you don't have to, so they're not, they don't need a public IP address and you can just get to them from that. Um, so I'm gonna start going through how we're gonna achieve this and build this. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna call this, make this command quantum net create public 
net uh, dash dash router external equals true. So what this does is this tells Quantum that we're creating a L2 network that a router can uplink to. So this network usually maps to a physical, physical IPs in one's infrastructure. So this network is uh, what we're going to use to allocate the floating IP addresses out of. So if you go to the terminal, um, the easiest way, uh, one way that you can go about doing this is you can copy and paste uh, from the etherpad to here. So once we did that, that just created the L2 broadcast domain. So we all up to. The so you want, if you're using the VNC, you should access the uh, the Etherpad from within the VNC window. Then you can copy paste. You won't be able to copy paste from your actual laptop, for example, um, directly in. So if you're using the VNC, you can go to bookmarks uh, in Firefox, and you can also access that page. So this just creates a L2 network that's attached that that's attached to like the edge of your cloud to the internet. That's just a layer two broadcast domain. So is everyone up to this point was able to get in and run that quantum command? You uh, do you need help? Uh, no, not yet. We'll do that in a sec. If you try to go to Google, will that work? Well, does, does he have it there? Maybe I think it's got to be a typo in the URL. If it works for me. Sorry. <laughs> Cool, so uh, I'm assuming we're all at this point. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to associate a subnet with that uh, network that we just created. So to do that, we're going to run this command, uh, quantum subnet create. We're going to specify the layer two broadcast network that we want to associate with a subnet. or username for the either pad. I don't know. Uh, let me see if it works for me.
So if, if you can't access the Etherpad, there's another link uh, that I have right here um, via Bitly, if you can access it via that. I think so. If someone wanted to look at what the you know quantum.conf looked like, or sure. So if you once you get to this link, uh, there's the IP addresses of all the hosts. You could SSH to those and look and look at the configurations if you want. They're all in Etsy Quantum and Etsy Nova. Yeah. Going to this. Yeah. So I. S so that means someone else is using that same IP address. If there are two people using it, it's going to. So if you type exit there, if you type exit, yep, and then type who, see there are multiple people who are there. I don't know. Uh, if you type exit one more time, what IP did you SSH to? Eight five. Yeah, so someone else also is accessing that. So what you can do is just say like public work one, or just add like a number to the end of it, um, or to the end of these commands, like name pu public subnet one, public network one, um, cause someone else is already on there. So um, do you have a pool of IPs that that public net gets attached to or something? Yep, that, that is what that pool of IPs is, that subnet. Um, Yeah, so someone also is on this lab is me, like they took my IV too. Someone's on your lab? Yeah. What's the IP? So someone handed out the lab. Or someone just guessed the IP. Hey, Eric. Uh, I think Eric said he had a couple extra ones. Okay, yeah, let's let's just continue moving forward. Cool, so once we created that network, uh, the next step we're gonna do is we're gonna just create a private subnet. Um, that we're going to use to connect our VMs to. 
So the first thing we're going to do is do quantum net create private net. And then after we do that, we're going to associate that private network with a subnet. Um, uh, we can talk about the config files later on um, if you want to talk about that later. Cool, so at this point, we should have two networks, a public network and a private network. So the next step that we're gonna do is we're gonna create a uh, external, or we're gonna create a router. So to do that, we're gonna do quantum uh, router create and then the router name. What does what do? So quantum net create creates a layer two broadcast domain. So that just creates a network. So like an isolated L switch. So if you look at the, this first slide, creating a network just creates this first switch right here. And then when we add a subnet to it, that associates that network with a subnet. So that, that puts the IPAM on that network. So after we create that network, the next thing we're gonna do is create the router. And then we're gonna attach the router uh, we're going we're gonna to set uh, that network's uh, gateway interface to be router one. Sure, uh, let's talk about the provider network stuff at the end after we make it through the tutorial. Cool, so one, one thing uh, to look at is once we run these commands, uh, this is what the topology is gonna look like in quantum. This is the uh, virtual topology. So, so this 1.1.1.1 uh, slash 24 is actually a physical router somewhere in the internet. So from your external host, um, his IP address is 2.2.2.2. So if you ping uh, this box, this represents just a physical router on, out on the internet. And the 2.2.2.1 IP address is the IP address that any host that's attached to this router is going to use to NAT with. So when he goes out to the internet, his, uh, what people are going to see is they're going to see 2.2.2.1 as the source IP. 1.1.1.2, sorry. Yep, 1.1.1.1 is a physical gateway that's in your data center. Mm -hmm. 1.1.1 is already uh, like known and already provisioned by the service provider in the lab. Mm -hmm. So if you ping from your host, you should be able to ping 1.1.1.1. Or if you trace route for it, trace route to it, you'll see that it hops through a router to get there. Change the password to be safe. 
Nah, it doesn't say that. Just get you to type it in. Uh, I'm plugged in because I wanted to. Can you just tell us to go black instead okay. of going to court like that? Okay. We are reporting. Okay. Gotcha. Cool, so at this point, we should have the router created and we should have it uplinked to the public subnet. Um, so the next step that we're gonna do is we're gonna uplink the private subnet that we, or the private network that we've already created to that subnet. So to do that, we're gonna do quantum uh, router interface add, and then we're gonna specify the router that we wanna add the interface to and the private subnet. So this is the command we're gonna be wanting to run. So after we do that, the topology is gonna look like this. There's gonna be a a gateway IP address to the local uh, network. So any VM that's attached to this private network is gonna be uh, going through this gateway, 10.0.0.1. Um, so was everyone able to uh, run that? Okay, cool. So the next part that we're gonna do is we're gonna switch back over to, uh, to, to this uh, etherpad here. And we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna start uh, provisioning the security groups. So the first security group that we're gonna create is the SSH security group. And what this group does is it allows uh, port 22 for TCP to be able to go in to the host. So the command that we should run is this. If you're trying to find the etherpad link uh, to the code pad, it's this right here. Wait, that's, that's just the, that's the non-etherpad. Non-etherpad. So after you created that security group, we're gonna add these two commands. Um, and after we do that, we're gonna go ahead and demo how the metadata works. Uh, we're going to show that we can insert an SSH key into the VM by doing a SSH key gen. So once you run that command, it'll generate a, a public and private SSH key, and then we'll update it to we'll upload it to Nova via this command here. Okay. Uh, this step, these steps are already past the presentation part. The presentation just showed the topology. I can show the, 
that right there. So we're just doing that just to show that you can ping it, uh, just to allow ICMP into it. Um, you could choose to not do that if you want. So this will just allow ICMP and uh, port 22 uh, for TCP to that host. Anything with the message that you have to send using the message Yep, exactly. Okay. There shouldn't be. Yeah, you should be creating VMs. So, once we get, once we all get that security group rule uh, created, then we're going to go ahead and uh, launch some VMs. Yep, except the default when you run the SSH key gen. I'm going to try and uh, SSH this host and catch up to you guys really quick. No, uh, yeah, the variables from uh, Nova uh, for Keystone are already set into your environment. Cool, so at this point, after you run SSH keygen, uh, it'll generate a key for us, and then we'll update it to Nova via this command here. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and boot a VM on this network, and we're gonna tell it to be part of the SSH group, and we're also gonna tell it to inject this uh, SSH key via metadata. So if we go back over here, uh, this VM that we're booting up is this jump host right here. So in order to do this, we're going to have to determine the network ID of the private network. So you can do this by doing quantum net show private net ID. So when you do that, it should display something like this. So the next thing we're going to do is... In can you just check to see whether everybody knows this? Because our connections are so slow. Okay, cool. So, so uh, is anyone stuck on a certain section? Like, is everyone generally up to the same point I am now? You are? Uh, is it now? Do, do you need help? It's too slow. Can, can you do this via SSH or are you using the VNC? Okay. So if, if you raise your hand, if you're, you're behind, uh, we can kind of like come and try and help, help you, or if it's just too slow, we'll just slow down a little. So is any, oh, uh, back there. Uh, anyone else uh, who's stuck? After you, one, two, and three. Yes. I do a, um, a port list. So my machine is, is using um, 10.0.0.2. Yep. So the, so yep. So one is the gateway. Yeah, so if you do dash.
So we're going to go ahead and just boot a VM just to get everyone to that st state. So, so in order to do that, we're going to uh, copy this ID here. And since we're going to reuse it, we're just going to save that in a variable. So if you copy, So this ID here is the ID of the network. So once we get that ID there, we're going to go ahead and boot a VM on that network. So that command is this one. So you can see here the parameters that we're passing to boot is we're going to tell it the image that we're booting is this uh, Cirrus image. We're telling it the flavor is one. So this basically tells it the size of the machine. So the number of cores, the amount of RAM and disk. And then we pass it the network ID, and that's the network that we want it on. This key name is the SSH key. We're telling it that we want it part of the SSH security group. And then this is just the name of the VM is Jumpbox1. So after you run that command, you should, if you run Nova List, you should see the status of the VM. And it says it's uh, currently active. It's been uh, booted. What's that? Okay, so w one thing to note what's going on, if you do quantum port list, you'll see that there are a few IPs uh, already there. So 10.0.0.1 is that uh, router interface IP. Uh, 10.0.0.2, that's the IP address of the first VM we booted up, um, which is the jump host. 10.0.0.3 is the DHCP um, agent. And that, that uh, port basically is used to serve DHCP for your network. And 10 uh, and 1.1.1.2, that's the IP address on the router interface that we're going to be using uh, to NAT with. So if we look back at this uh, diagram here, this should uh, make that more clear. So, yep, uh, so whenever you create a subnet, unless you specifically tell it that you don't want DHCP, there'll be a DHCP agent that is uh, spawned off that serves DHCP for that network. So uh, back here at the at the original slide, this shows the topology of what we have set up. So on the network node, there's a metadata agent and a DHCP agent, and also an L3 agent. And the L3 agent is what's used for the floating IPs. The DHCP agent serves DHCP. Cool. So is anyone stuck? Uh, if you raise your hand. Anyone else stuck? Are we all up to this point? Cool. So uh, the next thing that we can start doing is we need to get the ID of the, of the port we just uh, for the VM that we just booted. So if we look over here, we need a, the first command we need to do is quantum port list. And when you do this quantum port list, if you pass uh, dash C ID dash C fixed IPs, um, it should make it a little bit more readable. But we want to grab the ID of, of this port right here, the dot um, 1002. So once we get that ID, we again want to set it uh, to this uh, jump box port UUID variable.
and then we want to associate a floating IP with that port. <coughs> so to this create floating IP uh, command, what we did is we passed the port ID, and then we told it the network that we wanted this floating IP to be allocated out of. So as you can see here, uh, traffic that goes to 1.1.1.3 is going to be mapped to 10.0.0.2, and vice versa, incoming. Is anyone, is everyone up to this point? VM. They won't need a password because we have the SSH key. Oh, okay, okay. Later on, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yep. So uh, this ten one dot one dot one dot three is a is from the floating IP pool. Um, that we created earlier uh, during this step. So once you uh, assign that floating IP, we should be able to ping 1.1.1.3. And then we should also be able to SSH to it. And you have to specify the username, and the username for this is Cirrus. Uh, so if you do uh, Nova List. Uh, yep, I see. Uh, uh, can you do uh, Quantum Port Show with that EU ID? Yeah, just copy that. Just go there. Mm -hmm. Or can I see the commands you ran? That'd probably be the easiest one. And then quantum security group show with that idea. More security uh, dash group dash show. And then paste uh, that ID in. Oh, sorry. Security group ID. Hmm. Can you try pinging it again? I'm, I'm not sure why that's not working. So, um, A, can you make the font bigger there? Okay. So, so one more time, in order to figure out the IP address of So when you specify quantum port list, if you specify dash C fixed IPs and then space dash C ID, that allows you to have less things shown here. So you can uh, find the ID easily, more easy. Sure, and if you add uh, dash C uh, device owner, So an easier way actually to do this is probably a quantum port list dash C ID space dash C device owner. And we'll want to take uh, this UUID right here where the owner is compute. Sure. 
Sure. When you do Nova List, uh, that, that displays the instance ID, uh, UUID right here. And if you take this uh, ID that goes along with the port, if you do quantum port show, Uh, this device ID will match up. See, 26F, 26F. Cool. So, is everyone up until this point, or is anyone stuck? Almost until the end, you will not find a bug that which when you do the no one use, it's going to show the price. Yeah, I know. Okay. Okay, cool, thanks. Cool, so is anyone stuck? Yes? Anyone else? Yes? Uh, stuck? Mm -hmm. So do you know the list? Um, one, one thing is that in order to get to these VMs, you have to be on this external client. So if you look over here at the topology, this desktop VM isn't, on, isn't reachable via the internet. You need to be on this external client to get there. Uh, I think you're already there.
Uh, one thing is if you, if you uploaded the SSH key from the first machine rather than the second machine, you're not going to be able to SSH to it um, without entering a password. So just for notes, the, the username is Cirrus, and the password is Cubs when, uh, like that. Cool, so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, sorry. I, I think there is a bug related to that um, that's open, but it should have worked when you put that floating IP there. I'm not sure what's going on, sorry. I don't, I don't know, I'd, ha I'd have to investigate more what's going on, sorry. Cool, so are some people at this point? Yeah? Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, boot the two web servers um, to con continue this on. So before we boot these uh, web servers, we're gonna create a few more security groups. So we're gonna create a database security group and we're gonna create a web security group. Yep, yeah, so if you type exit to log out of that image, we're gonna go back to the external client. So we're gonna create these two uh, groups. So the first one, Quantum Security Group Database, and then Quantum Security Group Web. And after we did that, we're gonna add some rules to that. So to the web security group, we're gonna add this rule that allows uh, TCP port 80 to come ingress uh, to any member who's a part of that security group. The next rule that we're gonna add, uh, it's gonna allow uh, TCP port 3306 to be accessed um, by the database servers for anyone who's in the web group. So this uses a self-referential rule. So the nice thing about this is you can continue to boot web servers and, uh, and put them as part of the web security group and they'll all automatically be able to access the database security group. So more, uh, uh, like rules will be entered in automatically for you in order to allow communication to your database group. Yeah, the, yes, it's for the database security group and what it does is it allows anyone who's in the web group to access the members of the database group on port 3306. And the last thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna add these uh, two additional rules that are similar to that, this, to the similar self-referential rules that says that anyone who's in the database group uh, will allow the SSH group to SSH to them. So this allows our jump hosts to access all the instances. I'm not sure what's on the Etherpad anymore. Uh, it was on the Etherpad. Yeah. Sure. So from w once you SSH to the public IP address on the sheet of paper, you'll have to SSH to that additional jump box, which is the external client. So if you look at this topology here, you can see you're going to be landing on this desktop host. But this desktop host doesn't have connectivity to the outside world and to the internet. So you need to get to this external client. Uh, from this, you'll be able to access any of the floating IPs that we'll associate to. So once you land on the jump box, uh, you'll have to SSH to 10.127.1.201. Does that make sense? So if you're, if you're not able to ping the floating IPs when you think you are, when you, when you think you should be able to, make sure you're not doing it from the jump box. Make sure you're actually doing it from the external client host. Cool. 
So after we uh, created these security group rules and security groups, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to boot a few VMs that leverage these uh, rules. So if, if you still have uh, uh, this in your environment from the previous command, we should be able to paste these next three boot commands and uh, to boot these VMs for us. So when I do Nova list, we'll see that I have, uh, I just booted a web server one, web server two machine, a database server one machine, and they're in build state. And here are the IP addresses that they have received. And after running Nova list again, they've gone to active state.
All right, so just to keep things moving. I'm going to go ahead and uh, set up this web server. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to our jump box. So once we're at our jump box, we're going to SSH to our other instances. So as you can see, we have two web servers, uh, .0 .10 .0 .0 .4 and 10.0.0.5. So if I SSH to 10.0.0.4, it's going to prompt me for a password. And again, the password is cubswin. Yep, this is the password right here with the smiley face. So once we get to that machine, we have this uh, simple dummy web server to run. So we'll just go ahead and paste this command in here, and then we'll exit out from this machine. And we're going to go ahead and do the same thing for the other uh, web server. So what happens here is when a request comes in on port 80, um, it's going to echo back which web server it was, web server 1 or web server 2. So once you're back on the, the, the jump box, you should be able to wget against these IPs and see the response. Web server 1, web server 2. So the next part of this is we're going to put a load balancer up in front of these in order to uh, load balance these requests. Is anyone uh, uh, stuck that can raise their hand? We can send someone over. Uh. Cool, so uh, the next step that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and uh, provision a load balancer. So to do that, we need to get the, the subnet ID of the private network. So we can do that by quantum subnet show uh, private subnet. So we're going to go ahead and exit out of the jump box and run that command. And then again, we're going to go ahead and save this ID. After we get that ID, we're going to go ahead and create a load balancer pool. And then after we get the pool created, we're going to go ahead and add our two web server members to be part of this pool. So to do that, we'll type Nova List in order to figure out the IP address of the members. So if you did this out of order, 
um, your IPs may be different. So in my setup, uh, the two web servers are 10.0.0.4 and 10.0.0.5. 10.0.0.5. So we'll go ahead and uh, add those members to the pool. So we'll run these two commands here that add uh, these two members to be part of that uh, pool. So at this point, we have a uh, pool that contains two members. After creating this pool, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to associate a health monitor with the pool. So what this is going to do is it's going to check the status of our instances if they're still running. Uh, and if they are, they're going to keep them in the pool. And if not, then it's going to stop serving requests to them. So this is useful if one of your web servers dies behind the load balancer, then requests will no longer be forwarded to them. So after we create the health monitor, we're then going to associate it with the pool. So again, we're going to have to copy that ID and set it up like that. So to associate, we run this associate command here. Uh, it says it's pending create because it it hasn't yet been created yet. Um, so after we do that, the next thing we need to do is we need to create a virtual IP address. So that's our VIP IP. So what this does is any request that goes to this IP will be specified to the correct pool member. So we'll go ahead and uh, run this command to do that. So what this did here is any request that goes to 10.0.0.7 is going to go out to the pool members 10.0.0.4 and 10.0.0.5. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to associate a floating IP with this VIP. So to do that, we need to copy the VIP UUID. And the ID of the VIP is uh, located right here. The port ID is right here, so port ID. So if we copy this, and then uh, lastly, we associate that with the floating IP on the public network. So again, what this does is any traffic that goes to 10 10 or 1.1.1.4 will be directed to 10.0.0.7, and the same thing will happen in reverse. So if everything worked uh, correctly, you should be able to curl to this IP address, and you'll see that it load balances between the two servers. I do it once, web server 1, the next time it's web server 2. So uh, one, once you have that working, uh, one of the cool things uh, we can demonstrate to show that the health monitor is working is to actually delete one of the web servers and uh, see that the other web server is only going to be the one responding. So if you do Nova List, 
that'll display our instances that are running. And then you can just pick one of the web servers to delete, and it'll eventually get deleted. So I'm going to go ahead and delete web server two. So after I do this, uh, it'll take a few seconds to get detected. And when I curl to this IP address, um, only web server one should respond. Yep, the timeout was set to be three seconds. Yep. Um, give or take from whenever the VM is t torn down. So as you can see, when I curl to it, web server one is the only one that responds. So the next thing uh, to demo, I'd like to demo is the metadata stuff. So as I was saying in, in Folsom, we weren't able to support metadata with overlapping IPs. In Grizzly, now we can support metadata with overlapping IPs. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to set up the exact same network that we have now um, uh, to, to demo the overlapping IP ability. So to do that, we're going to go ahead and create a public network and a private network, um, exactly the same as we had done before. And we changed the names to be private net two. And if so, now if I do a quantum net list. You'll see I have two networks that overlap in IP addresses. So the next thing I'm going to do is I need to create a, a new router. And the reason why I need to create a new router is because you can't uplink um, an overlapping subnet to the same router. Otherwise, the router wouldn't know how to route between the two. So I'll go ahead and create that new router. And then I'll go ahead and uh, uplink the gateway of that network to the public network. And then I'll add the subnet uh, to be attached to that router. After that is done, we're going to go ahead and uh, boot another VM on this private network. So we'll need to determine the ID again. And we'll boot a VM that's also part of the SSH group so that we can SSH to it. So after a minute or so, if you do Nova list, you'll see this uh, another VM is booted, uh, VM2. And you can see there, there's actually a bug that happens here that says that it's associated with the same floating IP. But that's because uh, Nova doesn't have the overlapping IP stuff. And uh, this is something that we're, we have to fix upstream. So the next thing we need to do is we need to get the, I, the port ID of VM2. So if you do uh, quantum floating IP list just to see what the ID isn't. And then you do a quantum port list.
and then we'll go ahead and associate that port with a public IP again. So now if we should be able to, again, SSH to 10.0.1.1.1.6 uh, uh, without a password. And if we type if config, we'll see that his IP address is 10.0.0.1. And again, if we SSH to 10.0 or 1.1.1.3, um, same thing, no password, and, hit, and he has the exact same IP address. So both of the instances have the same IP address, but they have a different floating IP address. So previously, uh, metadata would not work if uh, the VMs overlapped an IP. So now that they can, they can work. Sure. So in order to term, determine the port ID, it's kind of a pain via the CLI. So you need to do a quantum port list, uh, dash C fixed IPs list. So when you look at this, you're going to see that you have two instances with the same IP address. So you need to figure out which one of these is not, uh, is not the correct one. So if you do quantum floating IP list, you'll see that we already have uh, one of the 10.0.0.2's IPs associated with the port ID, so we need to find the other one. Okay. So once you have the ID, what, how do you do that? Oh, so once I got that ID, then I associated that IP with a floating IP address. Yeah, so as I was saying uh, previously, uh, this isn't actually the two instances IP address if you do Nova list. If you do a uh, quantum floating IP list, uh, this will be displayed correctly. It's just uh, it's a bug in, in uh, the Nova list that we're going to fix upstream. So, so, so quantum floating IP list will show you. So previously, you had two IPs here. You had uh, the IP address, one IP address goes to the jump box, and the other IP address is to the VIP. So what I did is I created the exact same topology again, and then I associated that with uh, this IP address here. And this is a different VM. So, it'll, so quantum allows you to have like overlapping IPs in order to... So uh, Dan's going to go ahead and show what's going on behind the scenes on these labs. All these labs are running on our MVP cloud uh, back at uh, VMware. We have uh, about uh, 100 hypervisors um, that's running MVP, and that uh, runs OpenStack that we use to dog food all of our stuff on. And that's what we're using to deploy all these labs on. What's up? 
Where did I get the port ID? I got that from this command. I had to find the ID that matched the port. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch the display adapter to Dan's computer. It's picked up. I think it's on the other display. Okay, so you guys definitely feel free to keep mucking with the labs in the background. Um, I'm just going to, you know, kind of show you a bit about the infrastructure that we're using to run these labs. So this is, um, I think of this as the manager operator tool uh, for MVP. So this is all running quantum on quantum, right? Uh, the quantum plugin that's being used at your layer in the lab is the open source um, open vSwitch plugin. And then our cloud is actually running uh, on the quantum MVP plugin. So this is the MVP manager. And you can see the state that, uh, that MVP is created here. So this is an internal cloud that we're using for more than just the labs. Um, it's also for kind of internal engineering, dog, fooded, dog fooding, as he mentioned. It's, um, we actually have two internal clouds. This is the Folsom-based one, or is this the older? Oh, this is the Essex-based one still? OK. And then we've got another one that's Folsom um, and moving to Grizzly. So they'll be Folsom for all of about two weeks, I think, <laughs> uh, moving to Grizzly. So, um, so you can see here that we've created, um, you know, we've got about 100 or 90 hypervisors in the system. We've got a couple gateways. That's how you, that's kind of like our equivalent of the network node, how you get in and out. Um, they're all, you can see they're all phoned home and connected to the controller, which is a good thing. We've got about uh, just under 6,000 uh, logical ports in this setup and about 16, uh, 1,600 uh, different logical switches. So the, what you want to do here, if I go over to the search page, um, I can kind of query all the components. And so there are just a bunch of labs here. Um, but if I, for example, wanted to, you know, you told me you were having a problem with Lab 24, you know, because um, that's the lab that we handed to you, I could, you know, come in here and look and actually see what's going on underneath the covers with your lab. So like that diagram that Aaron showed earlier, right, each lab setup is essentially three different networks. Um, you could think of these as being three different VLANs, uh, but, you know, because it's using the NICERA technology and Open vSwitch, these are actually created with uh, overlay tunneling. So they're kind of, you know, you have the, the, the isolated L2 network, but without the, the limitations of VLANs. So, you know, here's the external network, here's the management network, here's the data network. Um, and then you can see here, here are the ports um, that, that you're all running on. So whoever's on Lab 24 is probably a pretty happy camper because everyone seems green. Um, <laughs> you know, you can zoom into individual ports and, uh, you know, we can do things like look at the statistics of, let me, 
My mouse seems to not be very happy. Um, you know, we'll be able to see if, uh, let's see. You know, we can see what hypervisor it's running on. For example, this is server 137. We can, you know, if we had to troubleshoot, we could see the Linux device that's on that hypervisor. So you just get a lot of, uh, lot of good management tools for this kind of stuff. So other than that, um, I don't think, unless there are any questions or if there's anything that people want to see in particular about this, that's all I kind of had. I just wanted to kind of give people a, a sneak peek of what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah? Service note, well, you, you should have gone to my MVP t deep dive on. Uh, <laughs> no, so, so as you know from my MVP deep dive, uh, <laughs> a service node, there's two different ways that you can. So when you're having these layer two segments, um, but you're tunneling, you need some strategy for, for how you handle broadcast and multicast replication on a logical network. And uh, one approach is just to have the hypervisor do it, do it itself, source replication. Um, service nodes let you offload that to another host. It's kind of a dedicated host for service node and, broad, and broadcast, uh, or for multicast and broadcast replication. This is one of the reasons that you can use overlay tunneling without having a dependency on something like multicast, like you know, in the traditional VXLAN model. It, you know, it's, you know, our services can be implemented in different ways. In some cases, the service may need some centralized component, in which case, yeah, it would, it would be located at a service node. But, you know, what we strive to do is actually implement all of the services or as much as possible at the edge in the, in the hypervisor itself, right? So you don't have to kind of waypoint through something. So that's what we kind of refer to as distributed services, right? Any other questions? <laughs> All right. Aaron, was there anything else you wanted to show? Otherwise, we're happy to just hang around and uh, answer other questions or help people through the labs.